And God says 470 times in the scripture the word praise is used. And that praise is to go to God. And in the connection of those 470 verses, almost all of those are towards God. Who do we praise? We praise God for what he has done. And, and, and God says to us, he says in Psalm 22, verse 3, he says, I live in, I, I live in. Because people say all the time, you know, where is God or where does God live? Well, we know God is omnipresent. He, he's everywhere. God's beside you. He's above you. Beneath God's, he's in you. Okay? But the manifest presence of God comes alive when you begin to praise him. Now, there's a difference between worship and praise. Worship is something that's solemn. It's, it's quiet. It's from your heart. You can worship God just through your prayers. You, you can pray out of your spirit without, without ever saying a word. Just begin to think. Let that thought or whatever that need is or that person, and you can begin praying. Yeah. You know, and a lot of us probably pray like that. We don't maybe pray out loud, but you can pray right out of your spirit. For that, and it's a form of worship. I can reverence God. I can be still before God. I can get on my face. I can kneel yeah. before God. And I can do that as a form of worship. Yeah. Jesus actually said in John 4, 24, that the time has come and now is when the true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. He said, no longer do you have, need to come to this sacred mountain come to the tabernacle you know God's not in this one little sacred place no he's everywhere and anywhere you choose to worship and to praise him he, he is going to come alive he said in praise he said I come alive in the praises of Israel and we know that that we we are are engrafted in with Israel so that word is spoken to us God said, I come alive when you begin to praise me. Praise isn't something that's quiet. It's not something reserved. You know, and, and that's why there's different churches. You know, some churches are, 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 are very reverent and very sacred. And we're more outgoing at the living well. And we're, we're, we're unique. Unique. But, but, but we, we're, we like the praise. We, we, pray, praise becomes something now that becomes manifest. Yes. Like how? Well, it might, it might just simply be praise like this. You know, it could be praise like this. You know, it could be praise like this. You know, it just it, beco it becomes seen. It may be vocal. We have a, a lot of shouters in here. Okay. <laughs> Again, you know that's. That's the uniqueness of our faith. That's who we are. We're a praising church. And because of that, God says, because of that, that gets my attention because I come to live in that. Yes, God's everywhere. But God says, when you begin to praise me, he said, then I feel welcome. I feel welcome to come alive in that. Let me ask you a question this morning. <clears throat> Do we have any waiters or waitresses? with us this morning. Uh, okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Will you ever go to a restaurant and you, and you ever go in and, and then sit down and you're waiting for someone to serve you? Yeah. They, they've overlooked you. Don't, don't, ever, don't ever go take a restaurant or a church just by one visit. Amen. Amen. And give a second chance. Right? We ever go to a restaurant and watch the waitress, she's zooming by you, and you sit there and you think, and, and what, what's our response? Uh, how do we act as Christians with that? We, we really get pretty selfish. And what do we do? We start talking. What, are they going to serve up? Where's our drinks? You know, I'm, I'm going to wait five more minutes, and I'm, we're getting up and leaving. <laughs> how many of you done that? Come on. You know, and probably what you do is probably based on what kind of attitude you got that day. 
know, you might say, hey, are we going to get some service over here? You know, or you could become real negative and, and, and probably show a poor reflection of who Jesus is. How many of you done that? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Or, or how many of you have ever been like a, a wedding crasher? Anybody ever like, or, or just go to a party where you're not invited? Like, like your, your relative might be having a party, or maybe they're getting married. You say, well, they didn't invite me. How, how do you feel? That hurts, right? Well, in the same aspect, that's what God is waiting for us. He's like sitting there like, when are you going to serve me? When are you going to acknowledge me? When are you going to pay attention to me? When are you going to invite me? You know, God is a God who desires our praise. Amen. That's what he wants. And, you know, we, we get, you know, we, we sometimes praise the things. We're, we're all guilty. Your pastor's guilty. We praise the things that we see. And, and, and they bring excitement to us. And, and when, it, when it, it, you take, like, the Steelers. If, if the Steelers are doing good, it's great excitement, right? And then all the forms of worship, all the forms of worship that's intended to go to God, see, the enemy comes to try to get you to worship something. Just a symbol. I, I mean, last Sunday, all, all I did was, when, when the Steelers scored, all I did was my And immediately the Holy Spirit was like, I'm like, okay. You know, so, so, so I need to work on that. God don't want us to have any other gods before him. He don't want us to worship any other gods, okay? So we need to forsake those gods, put those gods away, okay? So healing comes in confession. Your pastor is making confession right now, okay? And, 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 the, and the scripture says, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. And how do you know when you, you love something? Well, when they start losing, you shut the TV off, like, like a pump. Probably a lot of you did in the Buckeyes game yesterday. Okay? So, you know, I'm not in any way condemning. We have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? God wants us to grow up from that. So, you know, but at the same time, God don't want our praise and worship to go to something that's seen. You know, he wants us to put that away. He wants all praise to go to him. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. Now, when you look at the context of Psalm 22, here's David, inspired of God to write this. In the context of verse 3, we got to go back to 1 and 2 to realize what he's talking about. And he's actually, he's prophesying about Jesus going to the cross for us. And we know from the cross that Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And, and he's, he's prophesying that. But what David is really teaching us in this, you, you look at what Jesus went through, the agony, the torture, the pain, the suffering. Okay, So what David is really saying to us, that in the midst of what's going on in the earth, the world calls it a pandemic. What's going on in it? He said, in the most trying, difficult time, it may be concerning your life, your health, your finances. You know what? He says, this is the time where God wants to be invited. He wants to come live. And how is he going to come live in your environment, come in your situation? It's when you begin to praise him. And praise needs to become something of who we are. It only become an everyday atmosphere of our life. So if you're not listening to K-Love on the radio or have CDs you put in your car and worship music, you may want to challenge yourself to do that because God simply wants your praise. Whether you're singing to Him, singing about Him, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe just lifting your hands to Him. That might be the challenge that that God has you in, a place of freedom, you know, but, but, but God wants to extend his presence 
so you can endure moments that are like the cross. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Well, when you, when you think about joy, we know that we have an enemy of our soul. And his tactic is to steal, kill, and to destroy. Well, he wants to steal what you have in Christ. And he wants to take the joy from you. And, and joy is not based upon on just circumstances and situation. You know, our joy is in the Lord. And, and Nehemiah 8.2 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's our strength. So if there's one reason the enemy wants to come steal your joy, because he knows if he can get your joy, he's going to get your and when he gets your strength, then he knows he's going to get you in those weak, vulnerable places where he's going to be able to tear you down. So when it comes to joy, joy, ju just like praise, joy is a choice. Joy is a choice to just say, as I'm sitting there waiting on that waitress, I choose joy. <laughs> you know, really? <laughs> yeah. Get over here! You know? But... But, but I choose joy. That, that's how you keep it. You know, probably the greatest arsenal that God has given you in spiritual warfare is your mouth. And just simply having what you say. And when you sit there and you choose to, to complain about something, that's easier to do, to complain about it, because it's something we're seeing, we're experiencing, and we're feeling it. I'm feeling like I'm not wanted, you know, you don't want to serve me, you don't want my business, I'll take my business somewhere else. These are kind of things that we say and do, but at the same time, you know, that's the way that the enemy gets a right to steal away our very joy, because I've chosen to just sit around and murmur and to complain. What do I want to say in that? <laughs> I choose to joy. Help me, Jesus. I'm keeping my joy here. You know, it's calling those things that be not as if they are. Okay? Because if I just sit around and say, okay, we're leaving in five minutes, you know, I've done already. And then plus people know you. They know what you do, what you say, where you go. You know, you're the reflection of who Jesus is. So, you know, we're, we're to do our best. This is a choice of our free will that God gave us is it, to choose to walk in praise and to walk in, in joy. But the praise to God will set the atmosphere for everything else. If I've already been in an atmosphere where I've already built myself up in praise, then I'm going to be a carrier of that glory that I'm going to take no matter where I go. And even when I go in that restaurant, I'm not going to become offended or, you know, just any situation that's like that, I'm going to be able to respond in love because in praise, God's presence comes to give me that joy that I need to overcome what it is that I'm in the face of. So right here, the context of praise, here Jesus is upon the cross. And of course, we know Jesus at the cross. Many people say, well, was Jesus complaining? Was he saying, my God, my God, was it a complaint? No, he's just quoting. He's quoting what was prophesied of Psalm 22. So, you know, again, he shows us how to fight our battles. You know, in the most darkest moment of Jesus' life, what's he doing? He's quoting scripture. So, you know, did he feel good? No. Did it look good? No. But he, you don't find any complaint with him. So always, even when he said, I thirst, you know, it's not a complaint. He's just, he's quoting scripture. And, and we know that why he was on the cross he was providing the way for all of mankind by taking our sins upon him. In fact, Jesus was becoming the sin sacrifice. So the sins of the world were being put upon Jesus. That's why 1 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin, he became sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus bore that sin upon the cross. And anywhere sin is, God is not. And his presence departed from the Son in his deep, deepest heart. Because that was God's will for Jesus to be the sin sacrifice, to die for the entire world, so that we, you and I could be forgiven of all of our 
we're saying. So if there's ever a reason to praise God, look to the cross because Jesus took your place. He took your wrath. He took your punishment at that cross. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. Let's look at some powerful examples of what happens when you begin to praise God. And again, it's got to be go. It's got to go beyond the realm of your situation, of what you're seeing and what you're feeling. You know that that's easy to act natural to that, and all of us have fallen short in that. But let's take this situation with Paul and Silas, because we live in a world where we say and we think our mentality is: if I do good, I'm going to get good. And we really, what we're doing, we're basing our salvation upon ourselves. Now, let it be upon Jesus and be reminded that we're following him. Amen. And remember, all Jesus did was good. And under the Holy Ghost, went around doing good, healing all that were sick. And he ended up on the cross. So what can I expect? The more good that I do, the more persecution and difficulty I'm going to face. Because the enemy is going to rise up against you. You're trying to steal the good works that you're doing. The effect of the kingdom of God that you're doing. He's trying to take that away from you. Well, here's a case where Paul and Silas walked in their authority. And authority, again, it, 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 authority is another one of those things that's a choice. We're reminded that God gave us all the power and authority. I, took, I told you the last couple of weeks that your pastor is not a great fan of God's in charge. And I'm not condemning, I understand what people are trying to say by saying that God's in charge. But when I look at the world that we live in, I'm thinking, okay, God's in charge of this? If God's in charge, then, you know, then why do we need police officers? Or, or why are we going to put somebody in prison for murdering somebody? If God's in charge... That's what we ought to want, right? But no, God put man in charge. He gave the earth to man, and he gave him all power and authority. And he wants us to walk in the anointing. He wants us to walk as kings and priests. He wants us, his design is for us to rule the earth. That's his design. So by saying that God's in charge, then, then, then that sets God up for being to blame of every bad thing that happens in the earth, God gets the blame for it. And he normally does. So when we say that God's in charge, when really he's given free will to all mankind. So we, we live in a world where there's good and evil. There's blessings and there's curses. So we're going to see all, all the effects of that. Well, the authority has is, is been given. And, and, and why, if God was in charge, why would I pray for wisdom or you know, that, no, God, God wants to team and partner with us. That, that's his design. He created man to fellowship with man and partner with man. So he wants us to be dependent upon him. So let's come back to our lesson. Here Paul and Silas, they just cast a, a demon out of, a, out of an occult leader. This woman was a psyche. And the guys were making money off of her. So they're very angry at Paul and Silas. So they take rods and they beat Paul and Silas. Probably about beat them to the, probably to the point that they, they were almost critical. And they placed them in prison. So Paul and Silas did something they were taught to do. Walking in their power and authority, they did good and they're getting punished for it. And while they're put in prison, you and I would be tempted to probably say, why? God, I'm trying to do good. Why is this happening to me? So that's why we got to always look at the big picture, realize how the kingdom of God operates. Here Paul and Silas is in prison, and what do they do? They choose to make a choice to praise and, and to worship God. So they begin to pray and they begin to sing songs of, pra of praise to God. Now, do you think Paul and Silas felt like it? No. 
they, and you think that their feelings were probably hurt of why this is happening to them? Probably. But they knew that God doesn't change. And in order for God to come and to live in this dark atmosphere that they're placed in, they knew that God lives in those praises of his people. So they chose out of their free will to begin to praise God, even though they didn't feel like it. And what's God do? God responds to it. God responds to your praise. So you may need deliverance, deliverance from some dungeon that you're in that you've been captivated by, that maybe it may be some spirit of fear or maybe some kind of addiction, you know, and, and, and you need to be set free. God is challenging you. He's challenging you to begin to praise him. It's just like him sitting there waiting. When are you going to serve me? When are you going to worship me? When are you going to pray? Because Paul and Silas, they choose to do this. And what happens? God brings a suddenly, a suddenly into their life. That's that divine moment where everything's about to change. And it's about to change. It's where God shows up. And what's God doing? He's honoring the praise of Paul and Silas. And he comes, and he comes and moves in great power, and an earthquake takes place, and it shakes the whole foundation of that prison, and all the doors start popping open, and all the shackles and chains that they're in, they get loosed of it. God comes and delivers them and sets them free because he's honoring their praise to him. Because God lives. Where is God at? Where does God live? Yeah, he's everywhere, but his manifest presence, his miracle presence comes through praise. So why do I want to praise God? Because God wants to do something miraculous in your very life. Do you believe it? Okay, that, that's why you want to praise him. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Jo Jonah had the same experience. Now, Jonah, really, if you want to get technical, I like to call Jonah a racist. He didn't like the Ninevites. He didn't want any part of them. And just like God, he just tells them, I want you to go, tell them to repent and, and turn from their wicked way. He's like, no, I don't, I don't like those people. And I'm not, once he goes the opposite direction, he tries to run from God. And God, through his grace, as Jonah gets on a ship, God provides a great storm. God brought the storm that come rocking that boat, and Jonah knew it. Because of his relationship with his God, he knew that his sin was finding him out. He knew that that storm was there because of him. And he told the people on the boat, all you got to do is throw me off, and the storm will stop. And what do they do? They, they throw him off and shore off storm ceased. And then God, out of his grace, he provides a big fish. It's a whale, Matthew chapter 12, that comes to swallow Jonah up. And he swallows him up. And guess how long Jonah is in that whale's belly? Three days and three nights. Just as Jesus was in the heart of the earth. So here Jonah is as he's in there, and we're all thinking naturally, how, how's he staying alive? How's he getting oxygen? I just know, according to Jonah chapter 2, it was very miserable. He's hit rock bottom. He's at the lowest place in his life. And in those very low moments is usually the place where people turn to God. And Jonah did the same thing. And what did he do? He turned his attention to God. He began to make sacrifice beginning to worship God and immediately, immediately here comes a suddenly God speaks to the fish and the fish vomits Jonah up on dry land God brings mercy why? because Jonah chose to come out of his misery and turn to God and he did it out of heart of sacrifice a heart of praise Hallelujah. so why I want to praise God because God wants to deliver you out of the whale's belly. Let's look at this story. You with me? Say amen. Popular story about King Jehoshaphat. 
And when you look at this story, here is the report given to Jehoshaphat that three nations have collated and they've come against, they've come against Israel. And all of a sudden, here's Jehoshaphat realizing he's in a situation where he's vulnerable because they're outnumbered, they're outgunned, they're outmanned. They're in a situation where they're going to die. So what does he do? The scripture says that he looks up to God and then he declares a fast throughout the land. So he tells the people all to begin to fast and then they seek the Lord. And the Lord is going to give instruction. And how many of you know when God gives you instruction, it normally doesn't make sense to the natural? Again, that's faith. It's faith. And God, you're calling me to do something that doesn't make sense. You're wanting me to do something, and, and I don't know why, but I'm going to do it in faith. And always do it in faith, because without faith, we can't please God. So Jehoshaphat gets the word of the Lord, and look at here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15 through 17. Notice that God is directing to Judah of Jerusalem. Because every time you see Israel moving, here they were, they would set up tabernacles and they would move in the, in the desert region. Okay. Every time they would move, guess what tribe went first? Judah. Judah. When they crossed the Red Sea, Judah went first. When they went to war, Judah always went first. Well, guess what Judah means? <laughs> Judah means, so what's God saying? Allow praise to become a part of your life that it goes first in everything. Because that's what God wants from you. He wants your praise. And, and we're just reminded that Judah was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And, 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 and of those tribes, of all the descendants of the tribes that Jesus the Son of God could have come out of, he come out of Judah. So the, Re Revelation 5 5 says, He is the lion of the tribe of Judah that triumphs. Hallelujah. Again, praise brings victory. Everybody say that. Praise brings victory. So again, it's a choice that the enemy is fighting you. From, from, from doing God. He's fighting you from praising God because he knows the importance of praise and worship. And he knows that God comes, his presence comes when we begin to praise God. So he gives the instruction to Judah, and here's the word that's given. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Don't get hyper, don't get stressed. And don't want fear rule your life. Now, put yourself in their shoes. The report's coming. The enemy's breathing down your neck. They're going to take your life. What's God say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't get distressed. Come on now. This is a difficult thing when you're seeing something that is a reality. So right here, we, we, for, for a year and a half, we haven't said a whole lot about the whole pandemic issue. But that's what God's saying to you right now. He said, don't fear and don't, don't be dismayed, okay? Because the battle isn't yours. Everybody say, the battle is not mine, but it's God's. So how do I give God these battles that are going on in my life? I begin to praise and pray. I begin to tell God who he is. I begin talking to him. I begin worshiping him. Hallelujah. I begin clapping my hands. I begin dancing. Hallelujah. It's a form of every part of your body God designed for you to praise and worship him with. It might be with an instrument. You know, it might be with a, with, with a handkerchief. It may be with your hands that God wants you to praise him. And so he gives the instruction, don't fear. And then he gives the promise of what's going to happen. And then he reminds them again, fear not, nor be dismayed. Why? 
Because once you begin to become obedient to what God's calling you again, immediately the enemy is going to attack you. And he's going to come, and, he, and his number one weapon is to put fear, because he knows fear will stop you. And God reminds you, don't fear. Just do what I'm, what I'm telling you to do. He said, because the battle's mine. It's mine. How do I give that battle to God? I begin to praise him. He said, the Lord will be with you. And then look what happens in verse 21 and 22. When he consulted with the people, he pointed singers, singers unto the Lord. So here's the instruction that God gives. He says, I want you to put Judah out there first. And, and just like the walls of Jericho, he said, I want, I want you to begin to march into war. And all I want you to do is begin singing. He said, and begin singing the, 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 the beauty of the Lord. Sing it unto me. I want you to do it with thanksgiving. Praise the beauty of his holiness as they went out before the army. And say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for, for praise the Lord here is the word T-A-D-O-H. It's Tadah. And it means extended hands. Okay? So everybody just put your put your hands up right here like this. Hallelujah. That's what that praise the Lord is. So so that that may be something. You can put them down. That that may be something that God wants you to begin praising him like that. Now if you're driving down the road in your car, just try to use one hand. Okay? But but keep keep those fingers extended. Because when you think of that Hebrew word, tada, what do you think of when you hear the words tada? A magician. So the enemy comes to steal your praise, just like he does with football and sports and, and, and anything else that you're putting before God and allowing him to become a God. When you begin to praise it, you're going to become like it. So, so, so hear what I said. What you begin to praise, you're going to become like. So we want to become like God, right? You know, we want people to see God in our life, so we begin to praise. And the enemy, that's what he wanted from the beginning. So he wanted people to praise him, so he, he, he tries to deceive it. So you, you take a magician, he, he does his magic trick, and then what's he do? He goes, ta-da! And what's he do? He raises his hand. Same kind of thing, okay? So, well, what did God do through this strange military instruction? He brought a spirit of confusion upon the enemy. And let me tell you, when you praise God, God will put a confusion on your enemy. Man, I'm glad you got that, Mason. <laughs> when you praise God, God will put a spirit of confusion on your enemy. Why? Because, because the enemy from the beginning, when God created Lucifer, he put him in a position where the, the workmanship of his pipes was anointed. He was a great singer. Lucifer was probably the, the, the praise leader, choir leader of heaven. He, he knew the power of music. And when, remember when he got kicked out for wanting to be better than God? He took a third of the angels. He took them demons with him. And when they, the demons come to the earth, every time they see someone discovering the power of praise, and they see people beginning to praise God, it reminds them of what they once had. It reminds them that they have the regrets and and the shame and the embarrassment of what they once had when they were at the throne room of God and they lost it. So when you begin to praise God, it sets those spirits into confusion. And in this story, these three nations were in such confusion, they begin killing one another. And all of them were destroyed. God said, I'm going to destroy all of your enemies when you begin to praise me. Amen? Psalm 149, 6 through 9, it says, Let the high praises of God 
be in their mouth. So exalt God in the two-edged sword in their hand and execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor of all his saints praising the Lord. What's God saying? He's saying, you praise me, and I'm going to take care of your enemies. Amen. Remember what he told Judah. He said, praise me, and he said, the battle isn't yours. The battle's mine. How do I fight my battles? I just praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, and, and, and then take the steps that God has called us. It, it, it's, see, it, it's not, it's just not a, when I, when I say, you know, God, you know, well, God's in control, but God has called you to do things. It just, don't, don't just say, well, God, if God wants to bless me, he'll bless me. No, believe for that. You know, walk in that. It, it's just like, you know, if God wants me to comb my hair today, he'll comb my hair. Well, no, he, he left that up to you. You know, so he give you free will. So, so that's why praise becomes a choice that he wants you to walk in that. And he said, I want to take care of your enemies. Now here's a place where worship, where a leper come and fell down and worship Jesus and praised him. He needed healing in his life. Jesus said, yeah, that's my will. And he gave it to him. Okay, and so, you know, here's, here's a case too. What do I need from God? Well, what's God want from you? You know, God wants your praise. He wants your worship. Isaiah 61 and 3 tells us that, that it's a garment. It's a garment to put on. It's a choice. It's just like if you're cold and your coat's hanging in a closet, you might want to go get your coat and put your coat on. Well, it's the same thing with worship. If you begin to worship and begin to praise God, it's something that you choose to do. It's something you choose to put on. Well, I don't really feel that great today, but you know what? I'm going to praise my God anyways. I'm going to put my praise on. You know, you hear people say, I'm going to get my praise on. Well, well, that's what you're doing, and that's what God desires. Praise and worship is so important in our worship service. It's praise. This is Judah leads the way. Praise leads the way. Hallelujah. So we be taught the word of God so we can put on the garment of praise. And he says, you put on the garment of praise, and it's a, a, an exchange of all that depression, all that suicide, all those thoughts that you're feeling that's been weighing you down, that's making you feel anxious. He said, just put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. He said, when you praise me, I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to set you free. Hallelujah. Can we change up? Can you find a worship song? We have a worship song. Okay, last scripture, Psalm 18 and 3. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. How do I find deliverance? How am I going to let God fight my battles? How am I going to be set free? It all comes in praise. And it's what God is, is, is calling you and wanting you to become. He wants you to become of Judah. He wants you to become a person of great praise. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm not going to hold back anymore. Hallelujah. I'm going to give it all to you, God.